We have two goals in our talk today, so you'll let me know at the end whether we achieved our goals or not. Goal one is I want to try to encourage the faculty members here to think about undertaking something like RE Cares at their own conferences. And goal number two is I want to encourage the faculty and the students to consider helping us continue the development of this product for RE Cares 2018 or for a future CARES event. So as there, I, I don't need anything behind me, as you can see, I'm gonna be able to roll without any kind of uh, artifacts back there, so why not? Here's the scoop. We had a dog stool workshop paper, we had our own ACMW group projects, and then we had a panel that took place at the IEEE Requirements Engineering Conference in 2017 that inspired us to think about being able to take our experience at a research conference and use it for social good. The, the basic idea was that we get to travel around to all of these cool places and present our research papers at these conferences, but are we really making a difference in the surroundings where the conference is held? And we heard from a number of researchers who were able to actually assist some folks in their local area, and we thought, wow, as a community, we would like to be able to do that. So this idea for RE Cares was born. And fairly simple, the, uh, we have a paper that'll be coming out in IEEE software in about a month or so. And as we said here, oh, it's really basically just a five-step process, if we can get it to work. Step one, target a conference. Step two, identify a stakeholder that has a need for a software product and they're doing social good or public good. Step three, organize how you would gather the requirements, do the design, and then have a hackathon to start working on the product. Step four, mobilize some people to help you continue developing the product. And then step five, deliver it to the stakeholder. So that's what we did. Of course, that makes it sound a whole lot easier than it actually was, but I'll pass this around if you want to take a look at it. So here's what we did. We had the idea, we found some folks who were willing to help us, and we approached the organizers for the Requirements Engineering Conference in 2018, RE 2018, since the idea was born at RE 2017, and then we just started working on it. They helped us identify a stakeholder in Alberta, Canada, which is where RE 2018 was held in August. And we started on this work, I'd say about September of 2017. We started on it for August of 2018. And we identified a stakeholder who works with emergency response there in Alberta, and they were interested in having a secure private instant messaging app that they could use so that the emergency responders to these natural disasters or large disasters could communicate with each other. So we started working with the stakeholder to understand a little bit about what they wanted, and then we started doing a lot of preliminary work. We came up with some initial user stories and personas, which basically was where we were describing the different types of stakeholders who might use this instant messaging app. We actually had some University of Kentucky students and faculty who helped us dry run user story elicitation. We then did a, a quite a large dry run of our idea at the Revsku conference that was held in Europe in March. And then we ran a, a dry run of our hackathon, which I see Luke and Aiden are here, and they helped us run this dry run of our hackathon in the spring. So we felt like we were fairly well prepared, and then uh, we just basically started off on our venture. So maybe if we could look at the web page just really quickly. We had a great group of folks that were helping us, an international group of folks that were helping us, and one of them was Alessio Ferrari, and he helped us put together this website. If you just Google Wix and RE Cares, you'll find our website. So here, this is the home page, and you can see the slides I'm getting ready to show you, a video. If you look at resources, these are all of the different artifacts that we put together either before the conference, at the conference, or after the conference. And it's a pretty impressive list. If, you, if you're a software developer at all, you can see there that we have data model, wireframes, personas, user stories, 
and then eventually we started working on code. We have information about our organization, bios of our stakeholders, and we'll talk more about them in a, in a minute. I think Aaron's going to. And then we also did some analysis and evaluation of how RE Cares went. So we have some different quotes that we showed there. So I'm going to have Aaron jump to the slides real quickly, if you don't mind. And these are the slides that we showed at the closing session. So just to kind of give you an idea, we had these two stakeholders, and I already told you their needs, so we can go to the next. And we worked uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the conference, which ran Monday through Friday. Tuesday, we had a, an all-day session with our stakeholders where we elicited requirements. We had about 30 people that were there to assist us. On Wednesday, we had a panel as part of the conference. We got a lot of new participants there and repeated a lot of what we had done. On Thursday, we had an all-day hackathon, and then on Friday, we had a report out to the larger conference. Next. So here you can see we had a number of different artifacts. We came up with a name and a winning logo, which Aaron was our winner there for Cryer. And here they're going to talk to you a little bit about how it's developed in Rails. Next. And in the, at the same time, we had a hackathon that was going on in parallel in Haifa, Israel. And those students at the Shankar Design College were coming up with a tracker. So their idea was that a backpacker could be carrying this thing attached to their backpack. It would actually let them know that it had detected a fire. They could press a button, it would alert the ranger station, and it also would help navigate them out of the forest and away from the fire. And that was a pretty cool project too. Next. So the main thing, takeaway from this was we weren't done developing it at the end of the hackathon, okay? So we would love to encourage people to join us and help us continue developing this. And this was just a picture that we took at the end of the conference where we had our stakeholders in the middle. But I'm gonna turn it over now to Erin Combs, who's one of our alumni, and she's from Lexmark, and she'll talk to you, and then she's gonna turn it over to Jared Payne and then back to me. Hello, everybody. So some of the things that we went over in the slides that were just sort of glossed over, I'm gonna sort of expand on to more detail for everybody who didn't quite catch all of it. So if you caught that the project was an instant messaging app, I would like to correct and say that it is actually an incident management system because these people, our clients, were from a nonprofit organization who had the main function of evacuating people in a time of some sort of disaster, whether it be natural or man-made. The example that kept cropping up was a pipeline exploding in Alberta. So, this nonprofit organization is not composed of firefighters or police officers or EMT workers. These are sincerely just people who want to help others in a case of a situation that requires a lot of manpower and not necessarily specific training. So our clients were specifically the head of Mutual Aid Alberta, which is the nonprofit organization, and Chuck Brophy, who was a manager for a software company. So he had been in management for about 20 years, and they couldn't have been more different in terms of client style, but they were a really great example of exactly what kind of people software developers have to deal with in the face of getting the right requirements, because they both had ideas for what they wanted the system to be and how they wanted it to work, but one of them was much more lax and was fine with letting us choose any which way we wanted to go, which ultimately led us to creating several extra requirements that were completely out of scope and not useful for a three-day hackathon experience. The other was much more, he had a lot more faith in his own technical ability, so he felt it necessary to give us implementation details, which were not really in his scope of being a client or customer, so we got a really good dose of what it's like to be a, a business analyst in trying to suss out exactly what we wanted to make this system so ultimately, what we came to the conclusion of was there is no off-the-shelf product that would suit the needs of these clients because they needed a way to change the organizational structure of each particular incident, whereas 
you might have in a given incident. For example, a wildfire in Alberta, which is what was happening while we were in Banff this summer. Um, there would be a person who arrived on the scene to say, hey, there's a fire, there's smoke, I see it. And that person would immediately become an incident manager. Past that, there would be many different levels um, in the basic hierarchy, but other levels can be established. And of course, multiple sites of sort of the same wildfire can be established. So the data modeling got pretty out of hand. In addition to this, they wanted a particular functionality that we couldn't find in other instant messaging apps where we could download all of the data with accountability in mind. And this was more in a sense of the legality of the system because they wanted to be able to backtrack and say, well, during this incident at this time, John Doe was the incident commander and he issued this command instead of not keeping track of any of that data at all. Whereas if it were going over, say, a walkie-talkie, that data is not being recorded whatsoever. So this was mostly to communicate with the varying levels of volunteers that would be helping out in a situation with this many levels of people, so to speak. Okay, so running a hackathon. This was, I admit, not the best title we could have used for this because it wasn't a competition. It was several people coming together to create one project, ultimately. With that, we faced many different challenges, and we also got several different positives that we didn't expect. We actually had so many people that arrived to help us out with this project that we had to split everybody up into teams, which was a blessing and kind of a curse, because we had teams working on things that depended on each other. So we would have a team in one corner working on wireframes and drawing up how the web page should look while the other team was working on the data modeling of the application. And obviously, you can't make the web page look white right if you don't know exactly how the data modeling is going to be. So we struggled a little bit with that. But what was kind of cool and also kind of interesting was dealing with the many different people who were from other countries, obviously. There was a bit of a language barrier sometimes. But for the most part, everybody was really eager to help. And they brought in a lot of interesting perspectives that we wouldn't necessarily have had if we'd done it, say, here in Lexington. And along that same line, everybody had vastly different experience levels. Some of them were actually programmers. They were actually developers. Um, I don't think any of them were actually web developers, but that was OK because of something that I will bring up in a little bit. Uh, some of them were purely requirements engineers, and that's what they were best at, and that's what they focused on. Some had more of a tendency towards the data modeling side of things and the wireframing side of things. So ultimately, we got a lot of different abilities, and we were able to make a very robust application in a very short amount of time, or at least a plan for one. The actual application is not finished. Um, so if any of you all ever have the chance to run such a project, whether in a charity sense or otherwise, definitely work on limiting scope of the project, because given 12 hours in a or even longer, you never know what challenges you're going to pick up in that given day. And the more complicated you set out to make something, the harder it is to work on. And that is a sincere wish for others to take into account when they're making their own things. Um, so ultimately, what we made was a Rails app. And we chose Rails on purpose for a few different reasons. Um, it really benefited us in a hackathon sense, simply because it is open source. Use. Everybody can get it fairly easily, and it is also incredibly useful for prototyping. It doesn't take a lot of code to get something up and running, and that's what we really wanted was less time, more action, more development happening. So simply because Jared and I had worked with it before, we were able to assist everybody else in getting set up, and it ended up working out really well. Not to mention the Rails by itself is also really beneficial because it has an incredibly sophisticated testing suite along with it. So for something that needed to be secure and something that was going to be a long-term project later on, it was still a very viable option as opposed to using something simpler. All right, I think that's all I've got. I'm going to pass it over to Jared. Uh, 
Hi everyone, my name is Jared Payne and I wanted to spend a few moments to talk to you about the future of the Cryer Project and where it is now. Um, if we had the website pulled up, um, I can't see the tabs from here, but uh, we've only recently begun serious development process on the Cryer Project and the reason for that is because when we came back we started recruiting volunteers. Um, we have two professional developers who are slated to begin work on the project, contributing their time and volunteering in January. And we have three undergraduate volunteers that we have recruited from the ACMW who have decided to uh, contribute their time to work on the project. Uh, they are all currently freshmen, and I wanted to bring that up because they don't have necessarily the programming experience that a lot of so we're spending time each week to uh, help teach them about the project, about database design and web application development. And this has been a really interesting process because teaching these in tandem in order to work on a practical application has been unique in a sense that we teach them concepts and databases and then immediately apply it to a web application. And as they develop their table columns and then establish the relationships and code, you can immediately start seeing it click and they see their progress immediately. And so that's been incredibly rewarding. So uh, I know that there are several undergraduates attending right now. Uh, if you'd like to contribute time to the project and you're not sure whether or not you're qualified or experienced enough to contribute meaningfully, please come talk to us. We'd love to get to know you and see how you can contribute to the project. Uh, if you're more of an experienced developer, just want to learn a new tool and maybe work in a greenfield uh, project that would be pleasant to work in. Come talk to us. And finally, uh, yeah, Rails is one of the most practical skills that I've learned in my time in undergrad. I originally used it in my databases class. I used it uh, in my CS 99 class, I've used it to develop an API for another class. It's one of the most practical skills I've learned, and it'd be well worth your time to learn as well, and you can by volunteering with this project. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Hayes, and she'll promptly open it up for questions. Thank you. Of course, I have to say a few more things before I see whether or not we've accomplished our goals. So the first thing is I wanted to say to the faculty that it wasn't the case we absolutely started on this with, I felt, purely altruistic intentions. But in the end, it turned out that a number of my colleagues are actually going to be able to use information from this RE Cares event for their research and or for their teaching. So we had two of the people who were in our organization who filmed, who videoed and audioed all of the interactions with the stakeholders. So those videos are now being used by uh, one faculty member in Sweden and a faculty member in Germany as case studies to use with their undergraduate requirements engineering courses to have the students elicit requirements and pretend as if those were their stakeholders. And then we have a number of researchers who are planning to use the videos for research purposes where they do different transcription of videos and examine the difference between the two different approaches that we used. We used a design-driven approach, and then we also used, or excuse me, a design-thinking approach, and then we also used a task-driven approach. So that's just another thing for the faculty to think about if they have even the slightest inkling that they might like to undertake a CARES event at one of their conferences. So I think I'll, I'll close there and just say that hopefully I encourage some faculty members to think about doing something like this at their conference, and hopefully we encourage some faculty members and students to think about volunteering. And now we'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? Has anything been delivered to the stakeholders at this point? So, Dr. Finkel asked, has anything been delivered to the stakeholders at this point? The stakeholders have all of the artifacts that we developed, and in addition to the artifacts that are there on the website. We had literally a box full 
of artifacts that were hand drawn, the data models and wireframes and so on, and all those have been scanned and delivered to the to the stakeholders. The stakeholders are patiently waiting as we're working on this prototype. And they also did let us know, which took a little bit of the pressure off of us, that they most likely will not use our prototype in a production type mode, but that they would use it to then work with um, some professional developers that they have in their federal government to get a grant so that they could have a, a very, you know, treat it as a prototype as they then go on and, and would do a, a development and make sure that it was meeting HIPAA and some of their other types of regulations that they have that aren't necessarily the Canadian HIPAA, I guess you would call it, that we might not, of which we might not be aware. Yes? So uh, Dr. Trzynski says, well, why not just have the University of Alberta do this? And why not just have any time that you hold your conference, why not just have the local university do this? And this is an excellent question. It's the case, though, that sometimes our conferences and often some of the meetings, our international meetings, such as IFIT meetings, occur in places that absolutely do not have those types of resources. So for example, one of our meetings was in Costa Rica. So in those cases, uh, so it's, it can't, we can't be guaranteed that there's always going to be a local university or that that university would have the bandwidth or the capability to assist with something like this. And then the other thing is, you're narrow to the expertise of the people that are there in that university. And now we're able to bring together these people from all around the world who are experts and we absolutely cover the waterfront, at least in our field, in requirements engineering. So Dr. Finkel asks, what about long-term support? And this is an excellent question. And our colleague, uh, Alex Dekchar, who's assisting us with this, pointed out that if we can get this into the open source model, then we can have long-term support for the project. And in fact, as we've been recruiting volunteers, we discovered that there is an organization in Louisville that basically what they do is philanthropic coding. And so they've agreed when we get to the point that we're ready that they'll advertise our project as one of the projects that they would ask their volunteers to assist with and then they would help continue with the maintenance and it would be treated like any other open source project. Any other questions? So this is just the very beginnings of our Cryer app. So I, this is not the website for the RE Cares. This is the instant messaging app. And I, I don't know that anything happens past this at this point. Oh, okay, hold on. They're going to show you.
there's a, a person for PR, a person who's authorized to broadcast information to the public. There's uh, several different financial advisors. There's a liaison to the government. There's a liaison to uh, company. If it's a pipeline that bursts, that's obviously owned by a certain company. There's about about a dozen that are hard coded actual roles in their hierarchy. Everything else is supposed to be done on the fly, which is why we had to make a very flexible data model in terms of what positions are located at each incident location. And your role can change. So if you are the first person that shows up at a fire, you are the site supervisor and the incident commander. Until another person shows up who's more senior than you are, then you can say as the site supervisor that they become the incident commander. So it, it gets a little complicated. And especially with a shift based environment, those are going to be changing every eight hours, every six hours, every ten hours. It just depends. I would imagine there are plenty of such projects in Qatar. Uh, why to worry about providing support to Al Jazeera when you could worry about providing support to people who are doing something to physical disaster in South Africa? In a word, restriction. Only certain people are allowed to assign people new roles, for instance. So not just any Joe Schmo could become an incident commander. Although that is how it happens in the real world. A random person will happen upon an incident and report it. But uh, they can't go into the system and create it. This would not be open to uh, the public, for instance particular system for Alberta, there would be, uh, we, we have considered using domain names for email addresses for people to be able to register, because obviously um, all of the people who work for me, mutual aid Alberta, they have a specific email domain that they can use that would be easily verifiable. Um, started this project, we worked under the assumption that the system would only be available to certain employees of an organization. Uh, however, that's not the case. It's open to the general public. So there's this huge trade-off between everybody being accessible to it, it being accessible to everyone, excuse me, and uh, keeping the information private. For example, a scenario that kept getting brought up is that people tend to die in incidents of emergency situations. And a lot of that time, that information being publicized can cause bad things to happen if it is not done in a professional situation. So having that information to where it is not exposed until it is time for it to be is very important, as well as the legal obligations of making sure that the data has the integrity necessary to be presentable in court. Keep them coming. meant that we spent most of our time and resources and people who volunteered on the requirements elicitation because that's what everybody was good at. If everybody were good at operating systems, I would assume that they also had other engineering principles available to them, such as all the people who came to this requirements engineering conference and were still able to code along with us. So that would just take more of a different approach in terms of what is most important and what people are most valuable at. I mean, 
I would assume that they wouldn't take on a, a web application in particular as their project. That doesn't seem like something operating systems conferences would be interested in. But the point still stands. Engineers are engineers, and they like getting their hands. 